certainly should, John. And in fact, uh, the picture of the of the final state is a universe which has no impurities whatsoever in it. Peter speaks about it uh, in that way in which dwells righteousness. And in the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, pictures from the east to the west comes the sound of singing, glory to the Holy One. The time will come when evil is gone, when sin is gone, when there's no sin or evil whatsoever, and only God is there with his people, and there's praise and, and wonderful good things forever and ever. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they were no longer fit to be in God's presence, and God had put them out of the garden, you might even say, for their own good. Uh, the Bible begins and ends with this same idea. In the very opening chapters of the Bible, God says to them, In the day you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. The wages of sin was death back then. In the end of the Old Testament, Malachi pictures a time when the wicked become ashes under the soles of the feet of the righteous. This is Malachi chapter 4. It's a picture of total destruction. The New Testament opens with John the Baptist preaching, and he says about Jesus, that he, will, that he will gather the wheat into his barns or his garner, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Unquenchable fire simply means fire that cannot be put out. And fire that is not put out keeps burning. And fire that keeps burning does what fire does. It burns up whatever's put in it. And so unquenchable fire necessarily burns up what's put in it. And Jesus will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. It can't be resisted. It cannot be stopped. It cannot be put off or, or any way whatsoever. And so the final picture is death and destruction again. And then at the end of the New Testament in Revelation 21, when we have the same thing in Revelation 20, when he speaks of the lake of fire, which is the second death. It's life or death. It's life or death. It's life or death. And Jesus gives life. There's no reason for anybody to have to be part of the second death. That's the whole point. There is only immortality through Christ, and uh, this should be so blatantly uh, obvious to people. I wanted to go back to the Old Testament for a moment, Edward. You know, the uh, city of Sodom and Gomorrah is used where it says that the smoke of Sodom and Gomorrah shall go up forever and ever. Well, there's a point about that that people seem to miss, that it's not there anymore, and furthermore, there hasn't been a puff of smoke probably in several thousand years in that area. Not only that, the, the smoke itself that did go up, you can read about this in Genesis chapter 19, and the smoke that did go up was when Abraham went out the next morning, this is the end of the chapter after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham went out the next morning and looked on the place where the cities had been, and the smoke of, the, of those cities was rising. It was rising smoke. Revelation pictures judgment in terms of rising smoke, but this doesn't mean that people are down there in that smoke suffering. This is like the mushroom-shaped cloud. This means that there's nothing left. The punishment has already happened. The people are already dead and gone. There's nothing left but smoke to remind them of God's judgment. And that's especially important because Second Peter tells us in Second Peter chapter 2, verse 6, that God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly thereafter. In other words, they're an example of what's going to happen to the wicked. And in Jude chapter 7, Jude says the same idea about Sodom. He says, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. That doesn't mean the people of Sodom and Gomorrah are still suffering in fire right now. It means that eternal fire is fire that burns them up forever. And once they're gone, they're gone forever and they never come back. And so eternal punishment is eternal destruction, eternal capital punishment. It's, it's a thoroughgoing judgment that destroys both soul and body. It destroys them totally, and it destroys them forever. Sodom pictures that. The flood pictures that. Second Peter chapter 3, Peter says the ancient world was destroyed, flooded by water. The present heavens and earth are reserved for fire for the day of judgment, the destruction of ungodly men. The Bible is so clear on this when we once are able to see it, but we have to stop and take off our traditional glasses and look at these verses fresh and say, what do they say to me? Let me take their simple meaning. And let me not try to read something into them that isn't really there. Boy, that applies all over the place. Uh, I mentioned, too, uh, about my friend that I, uh, I went to school with, uh, and his uh, comment to me in our conversation was, you mean to tell me that people sin against God and that's all that uh, happens to them is they get eternal destruction. And I said, well, gee whiz, isn't that enough? 
That, that's really bizarre, isn't it? That people sometimes think that's not not a bad punishment. The very and, and it's amplified by the fact that the, that the that the wicked see the righteous going into eternal glory. And so, on the one hand, it's it's like a person's raised from the dead. They look around, they see these others going with Christ into eternal glory, and God says, "Nope, that's not for you. You go to the pit of fire." And you're going to suffer whatever you must suffer until you're gone and then you're destroyed forever. Who in the world would think that's an easy way out? It's only because of this terrible other idea of eternal conscious torment, which, by the way, has made atheists out of a lot of people. One of the most famous atheists, uh, Bertrand Russell, was uh, an atheist, he said, in large part because of the traditional doctrine of hell. Anthony Flew was one of the most noted atheists in the 20th century in England. He recently, a few years ago, wrote a book saying he now believes in the, in the God. He's not really the God of the Bible yet, but he's coming come in that direction. But Anthony Flew said the reason he cannot be a Christian is because of the traditional doctrine of hell. Uh, we should not change the doctrine because somebody doesn't like it. That's not the point. But the point is that this is a doctrine that's not taught in the Bible to start with, and it's a Bible that keeps. It's a doctrine that keeps people from accepting Christ and coming to the Lord unnecessarily when the Bible really doesn't teach that in the first place. I think if we got a lot of rid of a lot of Jewish fables and others along the way, Edward, Christianity would be a lot further down the road. But boy, we go kicking and screaming uh, when it comes to changing whatever our particular group of orthodoxy may be. That's why I get into trouble with people on a regular basis. Uh, to me, one man's orthodoxy is another man's heresy and vice versa. Uh, that's why I really appreciate the work that you've done. I have people on here that we might ag not agree on several other issues, but on at least one issue, we're in absolute agreement. And that's why I want people out there to realize that there is no place of eternal conscious torment, folks. It's important. We as Christians need to wake up and smell uh, the coffee. And Edward's book, The Fire That Consumes, as somebody called me about it the other day, go to his website, edwardfudge.com. Get the book. If there was ever a doubt in your mind. There's another book uh, that's on the website as well called Two Views of Hell. This is a book I wrote half of. Dr. Robert Peterson at Covenant Seminary wrote the other half. InterVarsity Press published it, and it's a debate, really, on this very subject. And people in that book can see both views at the same time. Each of us presents our own view, and each of us responds to the other's view. And so they, a person can say, well, let me consider both views. Let me look at the traditional view by one of its best advocates. Let me look at the uh, view that we call conditional immortality by, by myself. And we can then look and see how each person responds to the other with an open Bible and an open mind. We're not trying to trick anybody. We're not trying to cram anything down anybody's throat. We're just saying it'll be like the Bereans in Acts 17, 11, and 12 who were more noble than those at Thessalonica because they received the word with readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether these things were so.